There we go. Well, welcome everyone. Um, I am Eric Dewan, Managing Partner of the Employment Law Division at Michael Sullivan and Associates, here with my partner in fighting crime, Lisa Aguirre. Hi, Lisa. Hello. Can you um, see me? I, we can see you. And oh, I can't see me, so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, hey, I, I apologize that we were a little bit late. We had some uh, technical difficulties. So, um, but we are here now and we're gonna get started on these Cal OSHA um, amendments that everybody has been waiting for. Um, the uh, Cal OSHA has just decided to keep us waiting, meeting after meeting, public hearing after public hearing, and making us wait to see what is it we have to do. Um, so now we know um, what we have to do. Uh, before we get there, uh, just a few notes of, uh, about us, most of you know who we are, uh, but we have nine off uh, and uh, we do a lot of these webinars, especially since the pandemic uh, hit. There's these pictures, but I always skip right through this. Um, there you go. So we, since the pandemic hit, we, um, we started doing, uh, preparing materials for the public at large to try and figure out what to do with the pandemic. And then the, the major um, offer we provided back in March was this ebook that has been a live ebook, has been um, updated almost on a weekly basis as the uh, laws changed on a weekly basis to keep everybody updated. Um, we have in there now the Cal OSHA amendments. Um, there's more coming in that will probably be posted today or tomorrow. So that is free on SullivanAttorneys.com available to you. Um, and we're already getting Oh, we're already getting questions and I love it. And so it, that was my next point. So if you have questions, try and use the Q&A so we keep it in one place. Don't use the chat. Um, use the Q&A feature and we'll try and look at questions as we go through. We have a lot of material to go through. Um, so we'll try and take uh, questions um, as we go. And let's see. Uh, there's also a series of webinars. I think we're on, well, I think this is like 24 or 25 on COVID specific. So they're all um, available on SullivanAttorneys.com, available to you um, to take a look at. Um, and you know they have subjects for workers' comp and employment law in there for everybody. All right, what we're gonna talk about uh, today is um, obviously the Cal OSHA ETS standards. What do we do now? There's a lot of confusion out there. I get calls, I don't know about you, Lisa, but calls um, not just daily, but hourly about what do we do about these masks? What do we do with vaccinated? What do we do about mandating vaccines, these vaccine cards? Um, it is kind of a, a barrage. And we kept trying to hold off those questions because we didn't know what we we're gonna have to do. We had no idea. Um, and it, and uh, it was supposed to be implemented all of these new standards at the end of the month. But our good governor decided to say, we're not gonna wait, it's happening now. So they became immediately effective, which is why we did this impromptu webinar for everybody. Uh, and we'll talk, you know, we'll just talk briefly about uh, Fed OSHA, just to let you know where that's at. And we'll talk about the EEOC guidance on incentives and vaccines. All right, with that said, I am going, uh, Lisa is gonna start us off with um, some of the uh, information we have on masks and respirators, et cetera, and where we are. Um, so take it away, Lisa. Absolutely. Um, so we're gonna do a little look back. If you all remember in November of 2020, Cal OSHA came out with its uh, extensive detailed emergency temporary standards that all employers were required to adhere to. At the time, we, along with lots of other folks, did webinars. We wrote about it in our ebook, but it was it was a pretty big deal because it required a lot from our uh, from our employers. And Eric, we can move on. In May of this year, um, the circus that became this amended ETS standards began. Uh, Cal OSHA was trying to deal with the fact that there were vaccinations. Um, that, that face coverings may not be necessary any longer for vaccinated employees. 
but they were also very concerned about how to protect unvaccinated employees in the workplace. And uh, so Cal OSHA put out its initial amendments. It had a public hearing and I attended all three public hearings, which if you've ever attended a public hearing, it, it's a trip, boy. Um, Cal OSHA allows industry groups uh, and business associations to speak first. And, and there's some semblance of order there, but then when the public comes and speaks, boy, Damn boy. It. <laughs> it, uh, so in, in any case, uh, I know from which I speak, I have, I have uh, suffered through these amendments. I've written about the amendments each time only to have them withdrawn. Uh, and on June 9th, when the California Department of Public Health came out with their uh, face covering guidance for the reopening of California, Cal OSHA called an emergency meeting because the amendments that they had originally uh, proposed did not allow for vaccinated employees necessarily to go without face coverings in the workplace. And there was tremendous pushback from the public and industry groups uh, to what they did propose, which was requiring everybody to wear N95 masks which in this version of the amended regulations uh, is referred to as a respirator. So we have a, an emergency meeting on June 9th. Everything that was previously uh, approved and drafted is thrown out and we're starting over again in order to uh, somewhat come in line with what the CDHP has said about face coverings. And we can go on it here, Eric. Then on June 11th, we get what is now the amended ETS regulations. Uh, the final regulations were released in, uh, on June 11th. On June 17th, there was a uh, public hearing on this. Uh, I will tell you, Cal OSHA is uh, a little bit more conservative and had it not been for pressure from industry groups, the public, and in particular, Governor Newsom, I think we would have had a much more conservative uh, ETS uh, regulations that we'd be talking about today. Many of those on the Cal OSHA board were not happy with some of the uh, amendments that they eventually approved, but they did approve them. And in, in effect, they came in line with what the California Department of Public Health issued with respect to face masks. So as you know, the California Department of Health uh, eliminated mask requirements for fully vaccinated individuals, except in limited circumstances. And it did require masks for unvaccinated individuals uh, inside and in some businesses. Now understand the California Department of Health guidelines do not apply to the employer employee relationship. They apply to citizens, they apply to uh, how businesses may treat their customers, patrons, clients, et cetera. But it is these Cal OSHA ETS standards that apply to the relationship between employees and employers. So even though the California Department of Health said no masks for vaccinated uh, individuals, the ETS, had to also say that in order for employers, if they wish, to allow vaccinated employees to come into the workplace and not wear masks. Yep, and that's a it's a great point because uh, most of these calls I get say, "Well, CDC has changed everything. You know, public health department has changed, so we just follow that now, right?" I'm like, no, Cal OSHA controls for you, employer. Um, so you have to keep looking at that, although it, it might trigger if there's a change to take a look back at Cal OSHA or look at our book. Um, you have to follow the Cal OSHA as opposed to these other organizations. Absolutely. And understand that Cal OSHA has said in the public hearing that it has the ability to keep these uh, amendments in place for 210 days, which theoretically then brings us into January of 2022. They did warn, however, that should the situation change, should there be a surge in cases, that they would relook at these amendments and they couldn't make them stricter and more conservative. And so what they've done is they've kept a subcommittee together that will look at any needed amendments 
uh, to these regulations as we go through the remaining of the year and, and as we see uh, what happened with the coronavirus and now this Delta variant. Okay, so onward and upward. I do want to remind everybody of what the ETS regulations required of you in November and emphasize that it's still required of you today. There have been some changes and there are some things you no longer have to do. There are also things that are now required of you that weren't required previously. But I do want to emphasize that just because uh, the uh, emergency standards were amended doesn't mean that you can give up on your COVID-19 prevention program and training. In fact, the you have to add to it and you have to provide more training now. And Eric will or touch a little bit on that. You still have to identify COVID-19 hazards uh, and you have to allow uh, employees to do that as well. Still have to investigate COVID-19 cases. Now there will be some exceptions for vaccinated employees. We'll talk a little bit about that, but you still must investigate. You still must provide uh, testing to potentially exposed employees. Now, the good news is physical distancing for the most part has been eliminated. Mask wearing, however, has not for unvaccinated employees. The amended ETS does require employers to look at their ventilation and improve that. You still can't allow employees back into the workplace until quarantine ends. So quarantine and exclusion still remain in effect. You still have to pay your employees in certain situations when they are excluded from the workplace. Still got to record, report, and allow access to the information um, to the public health department, the local health department, et cetera. Outbreaks still must be reported. And with respect to employer provided housing and transportation, which we're not going to talk about today. However, if you have specific questions about that, you can take a look at our ebook where we do address it, or you can contact Eric and I uh, with respect to how you're going to handle those two issues now. In general, though, no face masks in either one of those situations. So because this was a little bit uh, difficult to understand with respect to the way the Cal OSHA kind of rolled these out, I wanted to put up front here, these are the major changes. Fully vaccinated employees don't have to wear face coverings anymore. However, and we're going to talk about this in another slide because I'm sure you're going to have questions about this. You must document your employee's vaccination status. And we'll talk about how to do that, the options you have available to you. Now, there are some exceptions to the space covering guideline, which we'll talk about. Mostly, it's, it's when we have uh, major outbreaks. A fully vaccinated employee without symptoms do not need to be tested or quarantined after they are a close contact with a COVID-19 case. Now remember, they're fully vaccinated, but if they exhibit symptoms, you must treat them as you would an unvaccinated employee. So fully vaccinated employees don't necessarily get a free pass and it doesn't allow you simply to ignore them because they are fully vaccinated. Uh, there are no face covering requirements for anybody outdoors. That includes unvaccinated folks as well. Now, outbreaks are a different story, uh, and Eric will touch on those because there are face covering requirements there. Employees who aren't fully vaccinated, so your unvaccinated employees, may request approved respirators when working indoors or in vehicles with others. Now, this is where the big controversy was with these regulations. Industry groups did not want uh, employers to have the administrative responsibility or to expend the cost of acquiring N95 masks. And we'll talk about what, what the respirator situation is going to look like, how you can acquire them, uh, sometimes at no cost, and what that's going to mean for your business. But this is where there was tremendous pushback. And in the original version of these uh, uh, regulations, Cal OSHA was set to require the employer provide N95 masks to all unvaccinated employees, regardless of whether or not they wanted to wear them. So industry groups pushed back and now we just have this voluntary. 
uh, wearing of these masks. Again, though, we'll get into this in more detail. Physical distancing and barrier requirements are eliminated, except during a major outbreak. And when there is a multiple case situation, the employer's got to take a look at what's, what's happening in the workplace and determine whether or not physical distancing needs to be uh, re-implemented. Uh, employers must evaluate their ventilation systems uh, to maximize outdoor air and increase filtration efficiency. And employers cannot retaliate uh, against employees for wearing masks or not wearing masks. Um, and there was a, a big uh, issue in these public hearings with mostly members of the public being concerned that employers would treat vaccinated and unvaccinated employees differently and that they were concerned there would be discrimination between these two groups. Um, and so really what the public was asking for is we don't want uh, to, to, to treat these two groups differently. And Cal OSHA said, no, we, are, we need to treat these two groups differently. They are different. And if someone decides to remain unvaccinated, they can, assuming that's the employer, employer's policy, but you have to make sure certain things happen. Okay, so we, let's move on, Eric, and start getting into the nitty gritty of uh, these new definitions. Yeah, and as so, we get into this, and, and Lisa and I, you, you and I talked about this offline, the reality is for everybody out there, when you implement these differences, it's going to have an effect on the team, right? You're going to have this pool of vaccinated uh, employees that get to walk around regularly, freely. And then you have everybody, these others that are going to just stand out with a highlight on them, a big spotlight that they have a mask on. And it's, it's going to be really important, the training component and updating our CPP plans. Um, all, all the CPP plans that you have out there are going to need to be amended with all of this type of stuff to flag for manager supervisors. Hey, we have to be careful how we treat this because it's already going to be a landmine, um, you know, waiting to happen. Wow. But didn't mean to interrupt you, but go ahead. No, nope, that, that's okay. And, and I fully agree. Uh, and, and I do want to point out that these are uh, minimum guidelines. If you as an employer decide you want to keep the masks in place because you have a workplace where people are working close together, um, you know, there are a lot of people who aren't uh, vaccinated or what have you, you can continue business as usual and not implement some of these changes. Uh, but, and that's up to you. So I, I want to just clarify that you're not required to allow your fully vaccinated employees to go without masks. You can still require masks, um, but, but these, this is what Cal OSHA minimally requires um, of you in, in the workplace setting. Yeah, so I, already, we, I already have ahead. employers that are deciding, hey, I'm not gonna get in the weeds with this. Um, everybody just, you wear a mask and you, and you socially distance. Yep. Um, and you can do that. You can do that. It's not gonna be a popular decision, but you can still do that. Yep. And, and then it then it does away with what Eric was saying uh, previously, which is kind of the push pull between the unvaccinated folks and the vaccinated folks. Um, so I do have some clients that are doing that uh, as well. So we do have a new definition here, fully vaccinated, and it is defined as the employer has documented that the person received at least 14 days prior, either the second dose in a two dose vaccine series or a single COVID-19 vaccine. Vaccines must be FDA approved or have an emergency use authorization, I can talk, from the FDA. So it also added uh, a component for employers that have international employees or have employees in uh, other countries who travel here. It allows for uh, persons fully vaccinated outside the United States uh, they can uh, use the vaccine as long as it's listed for emergency use by the World Health Organization. Um, and that was something that was added as a result of public comment. Now, let's talk about the fully vaccinated for just a second. The employer has documented. That's a requirement. Well, what, what does documented mean? Well, the commentary and some of the discussion at the public hearing uh, said the employee can provide proof of vaccination, their vaccination card, and the employer can maintain a copy of it front and back. 
the employee can provide proof of vaccination, and then the employer maintains a record of who was vaccinated, on what date, and the type of vaccination received. That's another way to document vaccination status. An employee can self-attest to vaccination status, and the employer maintains a record. This is where the employee just simply says, I was vaccinated or not, and the employer believes whatever they say. Um, and then as we just talked about, we can treat all employees as unvaccinated and everybody wears a mask. Um, I've, I've been asked, well, what do you recommend? What should we do in terms of documenting vaccination status? And Eric and I, I think we agree on this, that employers should require proof of vaccination and they should be making a copy of the front and back of an employee's vaccination card because uh, number one, it tells when the employee was vaccinated, on what dates they received their doses. So that way we can determine whether or not they're fully vaccinated, number one. And then number two, if there are booster requirements, we will be able to tell what vaccine they got, when they were vaccinated, and perhaps when they, when they need a, a booster. And not to say I don't trust uh, my employees, but I think the self-attestation is uh, a mistake because uh, as, we've, as we've emphasized, I do think there's going to be a push-pull between the vaccinated and the unvaccinated. And the unvaccinated, I, I would be worried, might say they are vaccinated so they don't have to wear um, a mask. And again, this is important because we don't know the extent um, of this, of this new Delta variant. We don't know how uh, vaccinations are going to work. We know they're not 100% effective. So it, it is still the employer's responsibility to uh, ensure as best they can following these guidelines at a minimum, uh, the safety of their employees. So- Yep, and I, I fully agree with, and that's the advice I've been giving because I'll be, upfront about the fact that I'm a cynic and I do not believe those attestations. I think, that, <laughs> I assume that they are a lie. And I want to see those cards front and back, obviously a copy, you do not keep the originals. You keep them in a confidential medical file like you would any other medical information. And uh, it, because we don't know what's gonna happen in the next few months. I mean, we don't, there's so much about these vaccines we do not know. Um, there's assumptions out there but if you have these in place, you can go to this file and you kind of know what to do. Um, if it's you know nine months or a year or whatever it is for Johnson & Johnson or Pfizer or Moderna, you have the documents to make your decisions and, and to roll it out. So I, I fully agree with you. I think that's kind of the only way to do it. Now, that being said, I you know, have clients who say, hey, it's, administratively, that's just a nightmare for me. You know, collecting these cards, keeping them, how do I do it? And I get it, it's about, you know, certain industries, construction, whatever it might be, it's hard. So you might be, have your back against the wall and maybe this attestation is the, you know, the best administratively for you, um, maybe not the most secure. And if you're going to do that, make sure you have policies in place of consequences in your policy for lying on these attestations, mm -hmm. um, including an up to termination. Um, which, you know, if it's in your policy and they are, you know, giving you a false attestation, uh, you know, as far as I'm concerned, that's grounds. Agree. Agree. Okay. So oh, wait, I went too fast. Sorry about that. Yeah. I mean, I know I talk fast, but not that. <laughs> okay. Uh, the, there's been a change in definitions and I don't mean there's been a change that the definition is necessarily changed, but the wording used has changed. And the reason is it, it, to, to come more in line with what we, we typically have used to describe these, these things um, and to come more in line with uh, federal and, and state definitions. So COVID-19 exposure, which was introduced originally in the November 2020 version has become close contact. The definition hasn't necessarily changed, but but now we don't talk about someone who's been exposed to COVID in the workplace as a COVID-19 exposure, they're a close contact. And to me, this is kind of like, duh. I mean, this is how we've, this is how we've been referring to people all along. Uh, so while the terms have changed, the definition has not, and it's still important that we determine uh, for investigative purposes, 
what the high risk exposure period is. That definition has not changed either. The high risk exposure period, if you will recall, is different for a COVID case, that's a COVID positive employee who develops symptoms and a COVID case who does not develop symptoms. So this is one way where we have seen the amendments make some changes, but it's important to not only understand the changes, but also understand that the underlying concept and definition is still in place. So we still have to deal with the high risk exposure period and investigating uh, that because we still need to determine who is a close contact for quarantine purposes, okay? Now, we do have an exception. An employee will not be considered a close contact if he or she wore a respirator required by the employer. And this required by the employer is interesting because the respirator doesn't have to be required by the employer. All the amendments say is the employer has to make them available to unvaccinated employees who request them. Now, Eric and I had a discussion uh, offline about whether or not an employer could require respirators. And the answer to that question is yes, they absolutely can. You absolutely can. There is a, a pretty significant burden on you because you have to develop and implement a program, which, which we will uh, highlight in our ebook. We're not gonna cover it today, um, but you can require respirators. Uh, but when we get to the section on respirators, you will see while you may or may not want to do that, depending on your industry, because the expense of doing so could be prohibitive. So you can require them. You don't have to. But if you had an employee who was wearing a respirator, they will not be considered a close contact, nor, remember, will the vaccinated employee who is not exhibiting symptoms. Okay. So that's the exception to the close contact definition. And that's a pretty okay. big perk. You know, you don't have this worry about excluding people and paying them, you know, if they have the N95 mask, right? There's a big perk there. Absolutely. Um, but on balance, you're right. I mean, once you hear it, it it's, it's going to be a big uh, burden on the employer to implement these. Right. Uh, and, before and we go- that was the pushback we got from the, from yeah. the public. Uh, before we go on, uh, we, I do see your, um, your Q and A's coming in. We appreciate them, but most of them I see is something we're gonna be answering as we go. So uh, we'll save uh, these. And if there's any that weren't answered, we'll try and get to them if we still have time. Yeah, at the end. Uh, so the COVID-19 case, uh, we understand that to be a COVID positive employee. There was three ways that someone could be a COVID uh, positive employee. They have added an additional way, which again, to me is kind of, well, duh. Uh, it has a positive COVID-19 diagnosis from a licensed healthcare provider. Well, yeah, okay. So I just point that out as something that has been uh, updated, but again, it's kind of something we already intuitively knew. All right, another uh, uh, definition clarification, and, and, and this is really what they are. They're more of a clarification. The work site definition is clarified. Um, and, and it's the same definition pretty much as before, but it the term is, is going to be used for notice requirements only. So the amendment really just said, we're gonna use this definition, which we've used in the past, but it's only for the purpose of notice requirements only. And this coupled with the exposed workplace becoming the exposed group, in other words, it's, it's reducing the number of people uh, who will be considered an, an exposed group for purposes of notification requirements. It, 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 it makes it a little bit more manageable. And this was done in response to large employers with large uh, workforces who were confused as to who gets this notification. As you recall, you've got to give notification within 24 hours. So these definitions uh, really try to deal with that larger employer who had, you know, hundreds, thousands of people at one workplace and were concerned that they now had to give notice to all of these people. Uh, that's not the case. Yeah, it was, it was a big deal because they're trying to crank out every day, you know, especially for healthcare providers, right? right? Um, every day of all these emails. And now this is, you know, if this would have been the case in, back in December, it would have made their lives a lot easier. Yeah, 
Absolutely. And, and luckily, in reality, what I'm seeing is a reduction in the number of, of COVID cases, uh, which is good. Um, but we're still we're still seeing COVID cases. And it's important to kind of understand how all of these uh, definitions work together. Okay, so exceptions to the exposed group. So you don't have to give notice to folks who uh, are, are just passing through. So a place where, where a person's momentarily passed through while everyone is wearing a face covering, which I also find interesting because while everyone is wearing a face covering, uh, I interpret to mean unvaccinated employees are wearing a face covering because we already know that vaccinated employees are not required to wear a face covering. So there's a little bit of uh, confusion in, in some of this language and I attribute it to um, how quickly Cal OSHA had to turn this around, how quickly they had to amend it. Uh, so I interpret it as while everyone is wearing a face covering to mean unvaccinated employees are wearing a face covering, right? Um, another exception is if the COVID-19 case was part of a distinct group of employees not present at the workplace at the same time as other employees. And this is important because I got a lot of calls from people who, who have shift work, right? And they say, oh my gosh, do I have to provide notice to everybody on both shifts of a COVID case? And what this is saying, <laughs> And, and this is really the advice I think, Eric, you and I were giving back in November anyway, is if they don't overlap, you don't have to give notice to both shifts. You just have to give notice to the shift on which the COVID uh, case worked. Um, and so this is just clarifying, I think, what we were already telling people anyway. Yeah. Um, and then if the COVID-19 case visited a work location area or common area for less than 15 minutes, during the high risk exposure period and all persons were wearing face coverings, read unvaccinated persons, um, at the time of the COVID case, um, those, po those folks are not part of the uh, exposed group. So to me, the exceptions to the exposed group don't really change anything that we've already been doing. They merely clarify, I think, the way we originally interpreted the regulations uh, to begin with. Yep. It's nice to be right six yeah, months later. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so here we go. This is a bit, this is a big deal. So yay. No yep. more physical distancing at all. Um, and, and there are some exceptions as, as we see, but in general no more physical distancing is required regardless of whether you're vaccinated or unvaccinated. Now, you must implement physical distancing requirements if you have a major outbreak, which is 20 or more cases in a 30-day period. Um, I, I, I don't see that happening much anymore, um, at least with my clients. I'm just not seeing major outbreaks uh, yep. like we saw earlier. Um, and I'm, I'm seeing fewer multiple case outbreaks which are three or more cases. Um, I'm not seeing that as much anymore. And so hopefully as this uh, virus kind of plays out and folks get vaccinated, um, we're not gonna have to deal with some of these, these exceptions. Yep. Um, there is a physical distancing exception when certain employers are unable to wear face coverings due to a physical or mental condition or disability, are not fully vaccinated and not COVID-19 tested at least once a week. Now, this is interesting. Um, if you COVID-19 test these people once a week and they're continuously negative, then the, the, there's no physical distancing requirement at all. I, I think this is burdensome. Yeah. I don't really see uh, employers, unless, unless they're larger employers, actually doing this, but you can eliminate any physical distancing requirements by testing people once a week. Okay. Yeah. Unless you have on-site testing, you know, at your facilities, something that's a little easier, sending people out everywhere. I mean, who's going to really do that uh, at the end of the day? Exactly. Exactly. So uh, that's one win. No more physical distancing uh, for anyone. Okay. So face coverings. As, as we've mentioned, this was a huge deal. This, this is what caused these public hearings to be six and eight hours long. All, everybody had to have their say about 
face coverings and what was a proper face covering and who had to wear them, etc. So what Cal OSHA has done is it, it, has, it has clarified the definition of a, of a face covering. It doesn't just mean anything you decide to put over your nose and mouth. It does have a very specific definition. And if you recall, the former regulations also required that employers provide clean undamaged face coverings to their employees. That requirement is still in place. However, employers must ensure that they are now providing the Cal OSHA definition of a proper face covering, which is a surgical mask, a medical procedure mask or respirator worn voluntarily or a tightly woven fabric or non-woven material of at least two layers. So anybody who's wearing a bandana, a scarf, a ski mask, uh, a turtleneck pulled up over their mouth, that is not sufficient. Um, and so Cal OSHA just wanted to make that, uh, make that clear to employers. Because Cal OSHA expressed a really strong concern about the safety of unvaccinated employees in the workplace. Um, and they really, really wanted to protect unvaccinated uh, employees. And we're really kind of, in my opinion, having listened to hours and hours of public hearings, strong-armed into dropping some of the more uh, stringent requirements that they initially wanted to impose. All righty, now we have some exceptions to the required use of face coverings. No need to wear face coverings if you're, vaccin if you're unvaccinated, if you're alone in a room or a vehicle. Yeah, duh. Uh, while eating or drinking at the workplace. Now, here's an interesting kind of caveat. Provided employees are at least six feet apart. See, we got the physical distancing that again here. And outside air supply to the area, if indoors, has been maximized. So what this seems to say is, if you're eating and drinking in the workplace, perhaps in a break room, you need to be uh, still six feet apart and you have to make sure that the outside air is has been maximized. I mean, how do you read this, Eric? Any other way? I don't know well, if this was Cal OSHA's intent or not. Yeah, um, that that is the way I read it. I mean, of course, if you know, especially the break room issue, right? Mm -hmm. Especially if, if if everybody in the break room is vaccinated, you know, obviously right. you don't have that issue. It's you know, it brings in everybody's in the back in, in the break room, and all of a sudden somebody comes in with their mask and they start eating everybody starts moving away, <laughs> do their six feet. This is the kind of stuff that, that makes it tricky. How are you gonna do that? Are you gonna stagger you know, break room um, occupancy with vaccinated and unvaccinated? You know, it creates that type of issue. It was even one of the questions in the Q&A, that's why I wanted to wait till now to answer it. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it's really up to the employer how you do it. In any event, you have to be very clear of what happens in those settings, um, whether you're vaccinated or unvaccinated. Yeah. And social distancing, but that is how I read it. Yeah, and, and it's somewhat of an administrative nightmare if an employer yeah, has absolutely. to believe this. Um, I will say here that if you are in a county that has stricter local ordinances in place, you are to follow those stricter local ordinances. Um, so for example, Santa Clara what? County had for a time, break rooms were closed, indoor yeah. break rooms were closed. Um, so if you're in a county like that, that does have more restrictive requirements, be sure you're following those because those are the ones that, uh, that, that you need to adhere to. Yep. And okay. just as, as a note, as we go through, I, I anticipate um, some of the things like this, they may modify shift or there might be advice that goes out there. Um, follow us on social media. We tend to do blasts out there on LinkedIn. Uh, Lisa and I are both really easy to find on there or the, the firm website, uh, the firm uh, link. And we'll, we'll try and update as these come out because uh, I expect in the next month that some of these things are really gonna shift or interpretations are gonna shift um, in, in probably some major ways. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and Cal OSHA did say during the hearing that they may use the frequently asked questions uh, section to kind of modify some of this right. as opposed to doing kind of a, ma a major uh, a kind of remodel of this or amendment of this, they may use the frequently asked questions to clarify certain things. And this would be one way to do it. Yep. Another exception to the use of face coverings is where employees, uh, unvaccinated employees are wearing respirators and 95 masks. So uh, then you don't need to obviously wear face coverings on top of that. Now, 
we'll talk a little bit more about this when we get to respirators, uh, but they must be used in compliance with section 5144. And I'll, we'll, we'll talk about what that means. It is a multiple page document that's very confusing unless you are in the world of regularly using respirators. Um, okay. You also don't need to use a face covering, as we know, if you have a medical or mental condition or disability that prevents you from wearing a face covering, or you are hearing impaired or communicating with that hearing impaired person. This is taken directly from the California Department of Public Health uh, guidelines as well. And the employer doesn't have to require a face covering when specific tasks would make it unfeasible to perform with a face covering or if there was some sort of hazard can only do it for limited time, you gotta put it right back on. So those are the exceptions to the face covering requirement. Um, in general, unvaccinated folks wear a face covering is, is kind of the general rule. Um, additional face covering requirements, employees exempted from wearing one uh, because of a medical or mental condition or while performing specific tasks must be at least six feet apart from others unless the unmasked employee is fully vaccinated or tested at least weekly. See that the, the weekly testing is coming back. So what we see is kind of the general overall uh, proclamation that there's no more physical distancing. And then we see it pop up again in some of these definitions. And I think uh, part of it is kind of the speed at which this was rolled out. Um, and so we're seeing some inconsistencies that I expect will be resolved over the next, over the next couple of months. Um, so you got someone with a medical or mental condition and they can't wear a face covering, uh, they've, got to, they've got to physically distance unless everyone's vaccinated. Um, again, I, I, I'm interested to see how this is all gonna play out in the workplace in reality, um, because I don't see it being as smooth as I think Cal OSHA would like it to be. Is it ever? <laughs> okay, and so we, we kind of talked about uh, the, the rest of these. But remember, even if you've got an employee who's, va who's vaccinated and wants to wear a mask, A, you've got to provide one, and B, you got to let them wear it. All right. Yeah, I, we have to be careful with that, you know, too, because there are, you know, I, I've heard employers saying, hey, you know, everybody vaccinated, you know, we don't want people where we want people to feel like, you know, we're vaccinated and safe, you know, um, you know, restaurant situations, right? You know, at a restaurant, you know, everybody who comes there, they don't have a mask, but everybody at the restaurant is, you know, is wearing a mask. Um, so there's this disparity of how these things play out in real life. So we don't want employers or even people they're working with to say, well, you know, take that mask off. You know, what are you doing? You're vaccinated. You know, what's your problem? So we have to be careful with that type of stuff. I can really see that being an issue as we go down the road. I, I agree. And I also agree with Eric that, that, uh, the, the COVID-19 uh, prevention programs need to be updated with specific instructions not to discriminate or harass people who wear masks or don't wear masks. And I think it's important that we train specifically our managers and supervisors to be yes. able to look out for this um, because I think it, it might happen. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, my last big topic, respirator use. Um, this is near and dear to my heart because I have watched Cal OSHA flip-flop on this issue since May 20th. Um, but we do have a respirator definition. We do have a respirator requirement. The respirator is defined as a protection device approved by the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health to protect the wearer from particulate matter, such as the N95 filtering face piece respirator. Um, and so... Cal OSHA has said N95s are uh, appropriate respirators. Uh, the employer, of course, it, it can choose whatever respirator it wants. Um, again, it, if you look at section 5144, which we will link to in the ebook, you will see that there is extensive requirements uh, when you issue respirators. If you issue respirators for voluntary use, in other words, the unvaccinated employee comes to you and says, I want an N95 mask. The requirements that you have related to that are significantly reduced because it's voluntary, um, right? So employers must comply with 5144C2, which basically is you, you've got to provide them with a notification 
on the use of respirators. Um, if it's the N95 mask, you don't need to do any kind of medical testing, which is required for either other types of respirators, or if your workplace requires respirators, one of the requirements of the respirator program is to make sure that employees are medically fit to wear one of these things. So that's kind of the push pull of required respirators is, is the employer obligations are much higher um, in not only issuance, but usage and, and training, okay? And then as part of uh, your training program and as part of your new updated COVID-19 prevention program, employers are to encourage respirator use and ensure that employees are provided with a respirator of the correct size. So what I think is going to ha happen is we're all going to become many, many experts on respirators, right? Correct size respirators, that kind of thing. Um, I will tell you that there was a huge pushback on this, and we can go to the, the next slide, Eric, um, from employers who said, this is gonna cost a fortune. We can't afford this. And so in order to alleviate some of that concern, uh, the state has made a million and 95 uh, masks available at no cost to employers at this website that we have here, saferatwork.covid19.ca.gov. And you can go there uh, and order respirators. Um, there's also websites available if you're a large or organization and need to you know, buy thousands of them. Um, but there is a concern on a run on N95 respirators, kind of like the run on toilet paper in the very beginning of all of this. Um, so. I can see everybody right now clicking on this link. Yeah. <laughs> I'll take 200,000. That'll be great. Thank you. Um, right. So and it'll, it'll probably run out fast. But I mean, and we were talking, I mean, these, you know, it's not like you can give them a respirator and it lasts, you know, a month. You have to keep changing these out. Right, right. The CDC guidance says respirators, N95s and spe specifically, should be uh, changed out every shift. Um, and specifically, every, uh, every time you lift it up and down, if you do that five times, the concern is it loses its shape, it's, it, it, it loses its you know, seal to the face. And so what I think is going to end up happening is, is there's going to be a lot of N95s given out. Um, so Cal OSHA kind of, you know, caved to public uh, pressure and said, you got to provide these things, but only if the unvaccinated employee asks for them. Uh, so what do you, what do you need to do? When employees ask for them, you have to train them how to wear it properly. Uh, you have to train them how to perform a seal check according to the manufacturer's instructions. So, uh, you know, I think no one among us I don't believe, is an expert in respirator use and N95 use. Um, I think it would behoove you to designate someone to get up to speed on this, to kind of learn what the manufacturers recommend, uh, put together some kind of a training uh, guideline, uh, and do the training for you. You got to inform workers that facial hair can interfere with the seal. I mean, they're not saying you got to require your, yeah, you require your employees <laughs> to shave, but you got to let them know that uh, it may not work as it's, as it should because of the, you know, the beard. Uh, and, and then of course ha you have to train how to use, properly use face coverings, which we've already supposed to have been doing. You must also tell people that face coverings are not respiratory protective equipment and that COVID-19 is an airborne disease. Again, we've known that that's what we've had to train on before. You also have to advise that N95 masks are, and more protective respirators protect the user from airborne disease, while face coverings primarily protect people around the user. Um, again, I don't, I, I don't have a sense of how many unvaccinated employees are going to actually want to use N95s, to be honest with you. Um, I wouldn't be shocked if, if not many actually want to use it. Uh, but. Cal OSHA has said, you need to have these available. And then I get the question, well, gosh, if, if these are in effect right now, and someone asks me today, what am I going to do? I don't have any N95 masks. Well, so, so 
what the guidance has suggested is you have to make a good faith effort um, and you can poll employees who are unvaccinated to determine whether or not they intend to make use of them so you know how many to acquire. You can just buy a bunch uh, based on how uh, what percentage of your employees are uh, unvaccinated. The idea is that you are are acting in good faith. You know, you're not waiting two months from now. Uh, you're not waiting uh, until someone asks. You yep. are affirmatively doing something to acquire these N95 masks. Okay. I don't know about you, but what a lot of my clients are doing right now is because these are immediately effective and we need to know the vaccination status of all these employees. People who you know understand these things, typically HR, we usually don't want managers and supervisors doing this. We want HR to understand the nuances because it's complicated to get out there and tell employees, you need to provide us however you're gonna do it, the copy of the vaccine card to a particular person who's, you know, don't hand it to a manager or supervisor and to that one secure person so they can tally and know who is vaccinated, who, who isn't, however you're gonna do it, whether it's attestations or whatever it might be. That should probably be rolling out yesterday. Yeah. Um, and with that request, however you do it with email or however you alert your employees, um, ask for, you know, for them when they do that to poll um, as well, those pe people who are not vaccinated of who would be interested in the N95 mask, highlighting all the kind of nuances and, you know, things that they have to do to get to use these things and whether they really want to. That gives you an idea of how many you really need to stockpile um, at your offices. Um, but the reality is you can't wait for them to ask you before you order them. They have to be immediately available or at least reasonably available, I think is the language. Yep, exactly, exactly. And so uh, the reason Eric and I have said uh, N95 masks could be uh, an expensive proposition for employers is because um, the CDC notes, they can't be cleaned or disinfected. Uh, they, can't, they have to be replaced if damaged. And as I said, CDC recommends replacing it after taking it on and off five times or at least uh, per shift. So if you've got a lot of folks who want to use these things, um, it, it, it can add up. And I'll also note that uh, all employees, regardless of vaccination status, uh, must be provided with a respirator when there's a major outbreak. Um, again, I don't know that there's going to be a lot of that, but that is, that is a requirement. Uh, there will also be training uh, that Cal OSHA will provide. They're going to update their, their training modules, and those should be available shortly as well, that you can use in conjunction with your specific uh, training for your workplace on, on these requirements. All righty. Um, you, this is you. It's, <laughs> yeah, it's not like I've stopped talking this whole time anyway, so I'm not sure it makes a terrible difference. But yeah, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll, I'll take it from here. We can keep chatting as we go. Um, and, and a lot of this stuff, we wanted to front load a lot of the material that, you know, the stuff we're really hearing about um, at the front with the exception of the vaccines. I am, that, that will be a little bit later um, in particular. But some of these things I might uh, fly through just for the interest of time and to get to some extra questions. But we'll start off with the notification to employees of a COVID case. Um, we knew about that. We have a few additional requirements. Um, it has to, of course, occur within one business day. It's not just if you know, it's or should have known. So you can't turn a blind eye if there's rumor around, you know, managers are hearing it, somebody's hearing it. You either should have known or knew. So be careful with, with that. Um, it has to be in a form that's readily understandable um, and uh, and if the employer sh reasonably, should reasonably know an employee hasn't received the notice or has uh, limited literacy, you can't just send it out to people you know um, are Spanish speaking only in English, right? It has to be in the form and you know these people can read. If you, don't, if you know that they can't read at all, you have to tell them verbally, right? That makes sense. You know, you don't send a notice to somebody who can't, who can't read. Um, and, uh, and update the notice that you have um, with the, uh, the current paid time off, everybody knows of the California sub sick leave and all the other sick leaves that we have um, available to employees. Make sure those are updated with the notices and what is available to them, workers' comp, et cetera. There's a whole list of things that has to go in the notice. All right. Um, you still have to notify others at the work site, not just the employees. 
independent contractors, also within one business day, still this or should have known. Um, independent contractors, probably because they're so worried about misclassified independent contractors in a state that probably doesn't have independent contractors anymore anyway. <laughs> so, um, so uh, it, I mean, that's a whole different story. Remember when AB5 was our big deal um, and now it's COVID. Um, authorized rep or an authorized representative of an employee at the work site, usually a union rep or somebody who's at the work site, um, that notice has to go out. Yeah. All and right. the, these amendments don't change what you provide to them. It just, uh, it just reminds us that you've got to provide them notice. Yep, absolutely. Um, continue making testing available. Uh, testing must be made available at no cost and during paid time, meaning it doesn't, not so you actually pay them during their time to go do this testing, traveling, coming back and forth. You want to make sure they are actually paid. Pay the employees of the employer who had a close contact. Everybody knows what that means. Six feet, cumulative 15 minutes, 24 hour period. Um, and provide them information on benefits available um, to them. Exceptions to this. Um, employers have been made, have been fully vaccinated. We know what that means. Uh, close contact and don't have COVID symptoms um, or prior COVID cases who have returned to work and have been uh, symptom-free for 90 days. So now we have these people who have actually had COVID-19. They're using this window of, we think it's about 90 days from when you're symptom-free of when you have the antibodies to keep um, you immune. So, and, and they're doing it conservatively. It's probably longer, but they're using 90 days as that window. So you also wanna be tracking people who have actually um, test, who have actually tested positive for COVID-19 because of this requirement. Um, and you should be tracking that, not just if it's a work-related um, incident, but whether you know at all. And we know from 1159, early in September, we had to kind of know these things and report it um, when we knew there was a COVID case, whether or not it was work-related. Um, so we should have like numbers and have an idea internally already because of what happened in September of who is and who isn't. And if not, you shouldn't be doing that. All right. Um, let's see, requires added employer uh, investigation rec record keeping to keep a track of fully vaccinated employees. You know, we, 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 that makes sense, right? Okay, keep medical information confidential. We know that. It's just the question is what medical inf information? Anything that has to do with these COVID cases, any surveys where they're talking about symptoms, any vax cards, that is medical information. These need to be kept in a confidential file, not in their personnel file. But Eric, Ask what can I tell my managers and supervisors? Do they get to know the vaccination status of the employees they supervise? Yeah, that's a, a fantastic question because a lot of this is going to be, how are they gonna, how are the managers, supervisors going to actually manage this? So you're not gonna have HR walking around with you all the time, mm -hmm. right? Um, how do I know as a, uh, as a manager, if you know the person wearing the mask or not wearing the mask should not be wearing the mask, mm -hmm. right? So I think with that situation, it should be go to HR, but in situations where the manager has to monitor these things on the go, they are a necessary person to know. It's a, necess it's a necessity to implement these rules that they know. Now, normally we would not, under any circumstances, give medical information to a manager or supervisor. Um, and even you know when somebody is disabled, all we tell them of, of what their restrictions are and that's you know, really it. Here, you kind of, you, you really have to in order to implement. That being said, and what a lot of um, our employers are doing is they're setting up now, after all of this is happening, a fresh training for their managers and supervisors to understand the implications of all these things. Our managers and supervisors are gonna be policing a lot of this, mm -hmm. right? Um, and not all of them are HR sensitive. So, we need to at least show as employers that we have done this training to the people who are, who are monitoring these things. And so much has happened in the last year. It is time for managers and supervisors to have these training. Maybe combine it with your sexual harassment training, whatever it might be. A lot of employers did um, that at the beginning of the year because that was required and uh, combined the CPP training. But in any event, the training is really important. Mm -hmm. um, uh, unredacted information on COVID-19 cases, uh, shall be provided. This is a new requirement to local uh, CP, CDPH or Cal OSHA upon request. Um, so you have to provide these unredacted um, uh, when it is requested. Is it going to be requested? Probably in 
mostly in outbreak or major outbreak type of scenarios, I expect, not on a regular basis or audit, I don't think. Uh, but in any event, you need to keep them. Um, the vaccinated status of an employee is considered confidential medical information. We just said that. Training and instruction. Now, we knew back in December that um, Cal OSHA said, hey, you have to train everybody on all these things we're telling you about. And everybody is hustling around going, how do I do that? You know, do we bring everybody in? I mean, everybody's home. How do I train everybody? Um, so everybody's scrambling of what they were supposed to do. Cal OSHA promised to do a link for training, which eventually they did, and they have a link on the DIR website. Now, with all these um, changes, and I'll highlight some of them, now that training has to be updated, which is supposed to happen soon, but I don't, I mean, if they're as slow as they were last time, it might be August, right? And there's um, really, again, no timeline of when you do this training, but it's, you know, inferred that it's now. So with all this, you know, the, the training, you probably should be doing it if it's not on the DIR website in the next four weeks um, directly, um, especially if you're bringing everybody into the workplace now, if people aren't working remote and you're starting to pile people into offices, that, prob that probably should be the training you have. Have somebody who understands these things do a full training before you bring everybody back in, um, if you can, would be my recommendation. Um, so the highlighted portions here are some of the changes um, in the training that is required. Um, and remember, the, the DIR has this training for these specifics, but you also have, have to have company specific training. Mm -hmm. So you're gonna have to supplement this training with your company specific information. Your, you know, the, the leaves you have available, the uh, options you have available, the sick pay, the vaca whatever you have, the PTO, all of that has to be um, provided to the employees in addition to this. Um, so, uh, you know, and I'm not, not going to really belabor um, a lot of these because of time. Um, yeah, it's pretty but, self-evident too. Yep. I, um, I don't, some of this you might have already been doing, but we wanted to highlight what Cal OSHA uh, considered to be new training. Yep. Um, so, so add these in, it's, it, I mean, it's mostly due to respirators and training and what the implications of those are, especially on, you know, the voluntary you know, requesting them and who can request them. Um, what people are really going to need to understand is, you know, when do I have to wear, you know, a mask outdoors, indoors, break rooms? You know, you probably should be very specific about that, especially the break room issue um, here. Um, okay. Um, let's see. Is there anything here that we really need to highlight? Um, how to access testing the uh, uh, and vaccination. Um, that wasn't in there before, um, you know, that's important to, to have in there. Um, conditions of the, under which uh, face coverings must be worn, that's going to be the biggie, right? Um, everybody's been asking the question, employers have. Employees are going to be all over the place on this. Mm -hmm. um, and there's going to be, I, I think, some controversial feelings about it in the workplace of how you deal with it. Mm -hmm. oh, all right. Um, exclusion of COVID cases. We talked about this a little bit already. You know, this was a big deal back in December. We're going to have to exclude people who were in close contact, six feet, 15 minutes, 24 hours, and then pay them. Um, that, um, that happening is going to be much less frequent because of the vaccination status, because, especially if there's an N95 situation available. So it's going to be less frequent that we're going to be excluding people. But for those that are unvaccinated, we still have to do these exclusions and we have to pay them. So um, exceptions to the requirement uh, that they were fully vaccinated before the close contact and who did not develop symptoms and COVID-19 uh, cases who were symptomatic, who returned to work and have remained symptom-free for 90 days. Remember that 90 day uh, mark for those people who have actually tested positive uh, for COVID-19. All right, um, the important thing about clarification on wage payments because everybody was saying, okay, I have to pay these people. You know, where is this pay going to come from? Is it going to come from FFCRA? Is it going to come from CalSUP sick leave? Is it going to come from their own sick bank? Um, all of the above can happen, but now there's a timing requirement. Um, and, and that is the wage must be paid no later than the regular payday for the pay period. So you don't get to wait a month. It goes in that regular pay, pay period as if they worked that day. 
um, in which the employee is excluded. If an exception to the wage payments applies, the employer must inform the employee of the exception. Um, so in, in other words, pay them right away. They get excluded, they get paid regularly, do not wait. Um, employees may file complaints with the DLSC and DOL if they don't get paid appropriately. And do we think employees will do that? Yes, they will. <laughs> yes, they will. Not doubt. Um, so now the DOL and DL DLSC have that power to implement these things. Okay, and that is, by the way, um, it, it, it's been interpreted, and I don't think it's specific, as retroactive as far as pay period. So if you weren't doing that before, you're a little bit exposed if you weren't doing that, because an interpretation here is that it could be retroactive um, of when that was required. Okay, um, exceptions to wage, pay wage payments when the employee received disability payments or it was covered by workers comp and received temporary disability. So that's that person who we exclude, and a couple of days later, they test positive for COVID-19 and they say it's work-related and it's workers' comp. You don't give them exclusion pay on top of workers' comp. They get one or the other, all right? And, they're not, and the reason is they're not considered ready and able to work because they, are, they have COVID-19. So they don't get the exclusion pay. Um, and when the employer, uh, employer demonstrates the close contact was not work-related. Um, and that burden is now on the employer. Um, that they have to demonstrate it, uh, not on the employee. Okay, return to work criteria. This is, you know, always, you know, the question and the answer for COVID-19. It's the same. It's it's same. The same. Yeah. Um, you still have to do this 24 hours have passed and uh, with, you know, 100.4, no fever reducing medication, uh, no COVID symptoms have improved still and at least 10 days have passed since COVID-19 symptoms first appeared. Um, and then we have this difference with COVID-19, uh, a, a minimum of 10 days for those who never develop symptoms. Okay. Um, now, return to work criteria for close contacts is a little different. Um, persons who had close contact but never developed symptoms may return to work within 10 days. Uh, persons who had close contact and developed symptoms but must satisfy the return to work criteria of COVID-19 case. Um, and that's what we just talked about the previous slide, mm -hmm. unless these three um, are, are present. The person tested negative for COVID-19 using a polymerase chain, a PCR test, with a specimen taken after the, uh, the onset of the symptoms, at least 10 days have passed, and the person has been symptom-free, not symptom-improved, symptom-free for at least 24 hours. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know about you, but it seems to me that the easier test is the one from the previous slide. Um, so that should probably be the one you're working with as opposed to getting these PCR tests. All right, multiple case and outbreaks. You know, the exception to every, all this good news we're hearing. And like Lisa said, um, I have seen um, at, at the beginning of, at, at the tail end of 2020 and at the very beginning of 2021, I did see this three or more outbreak scenario, and it was a mess for employers. I haven't seen uh, one of those um, in quite some time. Um, I think the last time might have been April um, was the last time I saw it um, locally. That's not to say it didn't happen, it just didn't come across my desk. Um, 20 or more is really infrequent. I did see those, but I haven't seen those in probably six months. Okay, um, so multiple case, we're just talking about regular outbreak, three or more, COVID-19 cases within, expo within an exposed group. We talked about that definition. Uh, visited the workplace during the high risk period, um, anytime during that 14 day period. Testing must be made available to those employees, um, except employees who were, were present at the workplace during the relevant 14 day period. Nothing new about that, that makes sense. They weren't there, they weren't gonna get it. Um, employees who were fully vaccinated before the close contact also makes sense. And COVID-19 cases, um, remember that 90 day mark for them. All right. Uh, multiple case and outbreaks. Uh, some additional requirements. Employers is exposed group shall wear face coverings when indoors now or when outdoors and less than six feet away. Um, and you must give notice to employees of their right to request a respirator. We already had to do that, but you have to do it again. When there's an outbreak, you have to roll the stuff out again to make sure um, you're safe. And remember, you still have to report um, outbreaks and major outbreaks um, to local public health. Um, employers must evaluate whether to implement physical distancing. That means it's up to you. In an outbreak situation, 
in your evaluation. If you can do it, do it until your outbreak within the 14 day period is over. That's the best way to do it, I think. Um, investigate ventilation systems, and I won't belabor this, but investigate the, your ventilation systems must be investigated also with um, the 20 or more, um, which is the size. So the major outbreak, uh, 20 or more employees COVID-19 case, big difference being 20 or more. Um, and you must make the uh, testing available to employees um, an exposed group regardless of vaccination status. So you're vaccinated, don't care. Um, you have to make testing available. Okay. Additional requirements must get notice to the employee for um, of the right to request a respirator. Again, physically distanced for all employees in the exposed group who are not wearing respirators and install, um, clean, uh, what is it? Oh, cleanable partitions. Well, the partitions that we were allowed to take down yeah, to put back <laughs> they out. <go> back up. <laughs> um, so I wouldn't put them that far away. Um, and I'll know about you, and I know we don't like these partitions and the plastic we put everywhere, but everybody put so much money and time into them. Keep them up for a while. You know, it's not going to hurt anybody um, unless it's really impeding your business. Keep up those partitions and the plastic. Give us some, give it some time. This just rolled out. Don't be the eager person to just rip everything down and say, yeah, we're free. Um, so, so keep those types of precautions in place. One of the other ones that isn't on the slide, but I want ever I get this question a lot. We talked about this offline, Lisa, is the um, the evaluations when people come into the workplace, um, the surveying. Still do that. Still have that survey at the beginning with all those questions when they come in. It's still a requirement um, under Cal OSHA. It wasn't highlighted here, but it was hasn't changed. Um, so still do that and and monitor symptoms. People have had them. Um, and everybody has those questionnaires when people walk in the door, whether they're employees or visitors. Okay. All right. Um, Fed OSHA, you know, I just wanted to give a nod to it because, you know, you see in the news and you hear about Biden and you hear about Fed OSHA, understand Cal OSHA is more stringent. So we're going to follow Cal OSHA. And the Fed OSHA um, requirements that came out were primarily for um, the, the, the healthcare facilities. Um, and, and that is here. I just want to give a nod to that. What we're talking about, unless you're a healthcare facility, um, then this would be important to you. And here's the link. But other than that, um, everything we've talked about before really controls. Vaccines, we're finally on it. I have not stopped hearing about the vaccine since it came out, um, about what we can do and if we can mandate it. When it first came out, um, back in, uh, and we got this EEOC guidance back in December. When I read it, and Lisa and I talked about it as well, and when I was reading about it, I was like, you know, it, it makes it sound at first glance like employers, go ahead and make everybody vaccinate. All you have to do is give them accommodations for disabilities and sincerely held religious beliefs. Um, but it wasn't really specific as to how different this vaccine, these vaccines are. These are emergency use authorization vaccines. Never has this been done before on and a national level, the way it is being done now. Has not, and what that means is it hasn't been fully tested and fully FDA approved. And they didn't really touch on that in the guidance in either the EEOC or the following DFEH guidance. So my concern at, that, at the beginning was, hey, you know, they left this gray area um, about these EUAs and that is what we're making people take. And we don't know all the side effects. You know, everybody knows, you know, the controversy over Johnson & Johnson after, you know, it, you know, started rolling out and some side effects to that. Um, you couldn't have anticipated that. Um, and the, so my guidance at the beginning was, hey, if you can hold off on doing this mandate, hold off on it. Hold off on it because you do not want to trailblaze on this incredibly new first impression, first generation issue, because there is a plaintiff's attorney under every rock reading the same thing here and just chomping at the bit to sue. And lo and behold, a few months later, lawsuits mm -hmm. from um, teachers associations and other you know, union groups, et cetera, in different states saying, hey, you know, there's this guidance out there. We're not talking about um, ADA and, and, and FIHA issues. We're saying you're using us as guinea pigs. When EUA um, laws came out, there was this caveat in the EUA uh, code 
has said people should have the ability to opt out of these, right? And that's back in 2004. So they're saying, hey, you're, you're, you're violating our rights. Um, and, um, and by the way, the actual interpretation of the code I disagree with because I think that only applies to the federal government requiring these EUAs, not private employers. But that's the debate that was happening. So lawsuits in California, one against LAUSD, pending in Central District, others in other states. Um, I had touted that, hey, we're still watching these cases, and we are. The LAUSD case, still not resolved. Uh, it keeps getting punted down the line because of procedural issues I won't get into. There was one in Texas um, where it was determined, and there was a complaint, you're in it through a healthcare facility, you can't make me do this, I'm not your guinea pig. And uh, the, the, the Texas um, court said, you're right. Well, no, you, you don't get that option. So, and this isn't violating your rights. And that's not how we interpret it EUA. So you can be mandated to get the vaccine in this healthcare facility situation, which is, is limited. But the note hit there is it's Texas. <laughs> so we're in California. Um, and as everybody on here knows, it is very different to be an employer in California than it is to be in Texas. Um, that's why people flee to Texas to be employers uh, during this time because it's much easier there. So I would still wait until we resolve the cases in California districts before considering the mandate, if you can. Now, that getting off my soapbox on that whole issue, you know, if you decide to do the mandate um, and use EEOC and DFEH guidance that says you can um, under ADA and FIHA, then have a very particular policy out there on mandating the vaccine. Um, something that is tailored by your employment law attorney to get you as protected as possible um, on, on the mandate and have a really good legitimate business reason for doing it. Right now, with the vaccinations already happening, people voluntarily doing it, you know, there's not as pressing an, an issue to mandate that vaccine for most employers. Um, so I would sit back and wait and see how much, and, and now you're going to know who's vaccinated, who's not you know, really balance of, well, I have three people and, you know, a series of 500 employees that aren't vaccinated. Am I really going to, you know, do this? Um, or am I just going to accommodate those people? Okay. Um, so uh, there are several options for, you know, accommodations that you can do for those people who actually do have disabilities or a sincerely held religious belief. And that is something that you can test according to EEOC and DFEH. It's not just them saying, you know, my belief is not to get vaccinated. You can ask for proof, what, what's your religion? What doctrine is that? Um, I don't necessarily recommend that unless, uh, because how much do we really wanna know about employees' religion without exposing ourselves to religious discrimination suits later? Um, so be cautious with those questions um, when, you, when you have them. So some examples that we're given are, uh, you know, providing PPEs, obviously ensuring physical distancing, offering a modified or staggered shift, so they're not on, um, on shift uh, with other people um, that aren't vaccinated, require periodic COVID tests, permit teleworking, and explore you know, reassignment. Now, one of the things that EEOC and DFEH does not say is if you can't accommodate them, you terminate them. It specifically says everything up to, but not including termination. So they're not saying, oh, we can't accommodate you, so you're fired, they say you have to figure something out with them. You can exclude them th from the workplace, but it doesn't give you a caveat to say you're turned. So be very careful about that. Um, and and, and I've, I don't know if you saw this or not, Lisa, because we haven't talked about it, but when the most recent EEOC uh, vaccination guidance came out, and I think it was Rudders or something like that did a mass blast, and the headline was federal government says, employers, you can mandate vaccines. So I get all these calls. Well, it's okay now. They said, it's okay. I'm like, what are you talking? And I got all these calls. I'm like, that is not what, um, what it says. That is not what these updates say. What these updates said is kind of the opposite. What the EEOC's amendments said at the beginning, uh, end of May, beginning of June was, hey, you know, we're just talking about ADA and FIHA we don't know about this EUA thing. You know, that's not really up to us. See this link to FDA, you know, so they passed the buck mm -hmm. on this EUA issue. 
um, and they and, and they backpedal. Um, so I'm like, no, that's not what it says. It says the opposite. It says they're not taking responsibility for this guidance on an EUA at all. They're just saying it doesn't violate ADA and FIHA. It could violate other laws, right? So be careful with that. What it did say, and are we getting to, let's see. I know I'm skipping around a little bit. Vaccine incentives, that's where I was going to go. Uh, anybody who knows me knows I don't really go by a slide. I just go. <laughs> so <laughs> so um, vaccine, vaccine incentives. I got a lot of these questions before because the EEOC guidance on incentives was all over the place and the limit was crazy. Like you can do an incentive for um, these types of programs for something like a water bottle. You can offer a water bottle. Really? <laughs> That's your incentive for getting people vaccinated. And, uh, you know, business owners and large organizations are saying, hey, EEOC, you know, if you really want us to incentivize people to do this, you got to, you know, untie our hands with, you know, throwing out water bottles to incentivize people. So what the EEOC said is, yes, you can give incentives to your employees. And, um, and, and, and there's two different types. If the incentive is simply um, show us voluntarily your vaccine card and show it and, and show it to us, there's no real cap on the incentive. Whatever you want to do for the bonus or whatever that incentive is, is fine. But if it is that uh, an incentive to which you are using um, a, a, a party through the employer or the employer itself that's administering these things, it's you know a health program that's highly restrictive and it cannot be, um, and what is the language, um, so substantial as to be coercive. So it can't be that much. What does that mean? They didn't tell us. Yeah. So um, there's not a lot of employers that are doing this, hiring out these third parties to do the vaccines or doing them you know, on site. There's not a lot of that. So you'll probably be more in this other bucket that doesn't have as much restriction on incentives um, of just showing the vaccine card. Now, you know, I'm not suggesting you, you know, offer 10 grand to everybody who shows you a vaccine card. You know, make it, you know, um, make it reasonable, make it, you know, incentivizing, but not, I also wouldn't go too far with these incentives. Okay. Um, uh, uh, GINA, the Genetic Information uh, Non-Discrimination Discrimination Act is also an aspect we have to be careful with. Um, uh, they, they have said that when um, you uh, ask about family members and, it, you know, if they've been vaccinated, that's fine. But if you're actually administering, it could fall into GINA and you cannot, um, you, you can't do that because you're asking for people's genetic information and that type of protected information and that is prohibited under GINA. Okay. Um, let's see. Oh, are we done? Fantastic. Okay. Wow. Look so, at us. Yeah, we, we got through that. So, um, and again, I, I you know, I want to see if we, we have about 21 questions. Do you want to, um, let's take a look and just see before we get off. How are we on time? Oh, never mind. It's 101. Uh, let's do a few of them and see if we can answer any that we're not because we did start late. So I want to give you your full time um, to do that. Um, uh, can an employer require a new hire or temp hire um, to be vaccinated? That goes into what we just talked about. The same issues apply with the risk of requiring vaccination. Does that change when it is a temp employee? Um, they are still an employee. So these rules still apply. Now, when we have our temp agencies on the outside, you know, we can we vet and say, you know, what are you doing with these employees? Are you sending me people? Because now the temp agency has to know by these rules who is and who isn't vaccinated, right? Um, so they should be telling you, the employers bringing the temp in, who is and who is not. So there might be some wiggle room in there, but um, an actual mandate on temp employees, you run some risk, um, the risk that I just mentioned. Um, it, advice on break rooms for vaccination, we talked a lot about that. So I hope that answers your question. Um, do you have to provide a separate room? I don't think you do, but uh, maybe in shifts um, and, um, you know, letting everybody know what is required um, when somebody's unvaccinated in the room. Yeah, I, I agree. I don't like providing different rooms for vaccinated and unvaccinated because you're just highlighting the differences. How separate people are. Yeah. yeah. Uh, any, any type of segregation of that sort is just pro is probably not going to turn out well. Um, 
what exceptions are there to the uh, lifted mat? Well, we talked a lot about the lifted uh, mask requirements for homeless shelters in specific. Um, so I, what I would say to that, Eric, is uh, there's, there's no changes. You, you adhere to the amended ETS regulations as the employer. Um, that's how you would handle it. You may decide that you're going to treat all your employees as unvaccinated and require them to mask up no matter what. You yeah, and that, might, and that might be the kind of scenario where it would absolutely make sense right. um, to do that. Sorry, I, you know, great, you're vaccinated. We're happy you're vaccinated, um, but wear your mask and socially distance. Yep. Right. Um, we've just received second dose, need to wear a mask or work until the two weeks pass. The answer is yes. Um, do employees still need to quarantine when they travel outside of state and country? Now, there are, uh, and this gets a little confusing because there are suggestions by CDC of what you do when you travel and the seven day quarantine period and these recommendations. Are, as the employer, they are these seven day quarantines mandatory? They are not. You may want to follow them uh, when somebody travels. The, the, the caveat there is be very careful about who you, if you're gonna do that, who you require to be quarantined because you don't want a discrimination issue. Oh, everybody who's going to China, gets, you know, quarantine. Everybody who goes to Mexico, anybody who goes any, I mean, whatever plane you're on is the same risk as far as I'm concerned, um, it, it, whether it's domestic or international. So if they're flying domestic, you should have the same rule. Um, I, but now understand though, there are some counties that have uh, required quarantine mandates right. for folks who travel. And if that's the case, if your county, for example, Santa Clara County had it, um, you got to follow that. Right. And that applies to everything we're saying now, because we can't just be county specific um, here. If you're you always check your county updates um, on those, because those always control, they can always be stricter. Um, and, you know, if you're in San Francisco, you know that better than anybody. So, <laughs> so keep an eye on those things. Um, let's see. Uh, Kelsh just speaks to business relationships to the public customers now. Uh, okay, so Kalisha speaks to, no, so the actual reverse of this. So the question is, um, Kalisha speaks to business relationships to the public customers, not to specifically the business relationships to employees, the actual reverse. Kalosha um, controls the relationship with your employees. Um, so that's what's gonna control for you as the employer. And the California Department of Health um, and other agencies would apply to your relationship with your customers. Absolutely. Okay. Um, employees need medical clearance to wear N95 masks if voluntary, who is responsible to ensure? Uh, I don't believe there is a requirement no. for- uh, there's, there's no medical clearance for an N95 mask because it is considered a dust, a, a dust mask. Um, however, if you require it, or if you use some other kind of respirator, there are medical clearance requirements, which we will have on uh, uh, on our, our COVID book on the website. Yep. Um, is physical distancing required outdoors since uh, no one is required to wear a mask? Well, as you now know, some people you know are required to wear a mask, but not outdoors. And the physical, physical distancing requirement is lifted. Uh, remember that um, you know when you have outbreaks or major outbreaks, it shifts. Um, but that's the status. Okay. Um, let's see. What is a respirator? I think we answered that pretty, <laughs> pretty well. Um, uh, will you be offering a, um, a revised template for the written COVID CPP plan? Um, we do have a CPP plan on our website. Um, and we will look into doing some revisions. I can't promise that with uh, quickly. No, but, and what I will say though is that they have they have a plan. Kalosha has a draft plan on their website as well. Is that um, and I didn't know that is the draft new CPP plan on there with these new changes? It will be. Okay, I don't know, it's not yet. I do not know if it's there yet. Um, what I will do though is I will link it in, on our website on our ebook on the website uh, when it becomes available. Yeah, and what I'll do also is I'll do a blast on social media when it does, so people can easily just click the link. Yeah. Uh, great question, thank you. Um, let's see, I think. Um, 
Hold on one second. Uh, re wages must be paid no later than the re regular payday. This is only applicable to COVID cases, not applicable for using California sick leave for vaccine. So that's required for the exclusion pay when you're not COVID cases, but the, those that you're excluding. And, um, it, and if they're using CalSUP sick leave as that pay, which you can. And remember CalSUP sick leave has this interesting, you know, they use it upon request. You know, uh, the employee can request CalSUP sick leave, you know, always offer it to them to use those 80 hours, especially in this scenario, because you can specifically use it for exclusion pay. Um, should we still do temperature checks upon arrival at work in addition to the questionnaires? Um, well, when it says you have to um, survey people who come in, it doesn't specifically say you have to temperature check. You know, some people were doing both temperature checks and surveys. Um, some people were doing, you know, one or the other. Um, so the temperature check, I don't think it's a requirement, um, but, you know, if you've been doing it, maybe keep it in place for a little bit longer. Um, the, the, the questionnaire, if you're it, at least the questionnaire, um, you should still be doing. Um, let's see, I uh, protect you from retaliation. Can you speak to that today? So yes, um, you cannot retaliate against somebody. I think we talked about that. Uh, the question is, Kalosha ETS, it uh, protects from retaliation. Can you speak to that? We, we talked a little bit about it already. You can't retaliate against somebody who chooses um, to wear masks. Um, you can't retaliate against somebody who complains about vaccines or doesn't want to get vaccinated. Um, and so those retaliation components are important. Again, remember you had to have that retaliation language in your CPP plan um, or a, a reference to it. So that still applies. So you should already have those things, adding the face covering um, issue since that's pretty new. Um, what, what's your take on not being coercive versus, yeah, so incentives, what is not being coercive? I mean, that is, that's a tough call. I, I, in that, where that language is for when you're actually providing the vaccines or, or you're providing the third party through the employer, um, I would keep it pretty minimal. Yeah, um, I would, too. I, I, would keep, I would keep it minimal. Um, again, if you're just doing this voluntary vax card as the incentive, that's the easiest and safest bet um, for incentivizing. And you don't have these, uh, these necessary caps. Okay. Uh, let's see. Thanks for all the questions. I think Does they keep the coming 10 in. 2021 sunset, that's no longer applicable. That was the question, does the original uh, October 2nd, 2021 expiration date still apply? No, because the November 2020 uh, regs were replaced with the amended regs, which don't yet have an expiration date, but could go as long as January of 2022. Yeah. Um, and it asks about the self-certification daily. I, and, and for how long, I would continue it during these ETS standards until they say you don't have to. Right. Um, and that could potentially be through January. So I would continue doing those, um, those self-certifications. However you're doing and, and, them. So yeah, exactly. And that's important because even if we didn't cover it today, it means it's still in place, yep. right? What we covered were the changes. So the things we didn't touch on um, you're still there. required to do. And I, I would recommend uh, going to the website and taking a look at our COVID book because we will have that updated today or tomorrow with all of the new amendments. So you can look at it all in one place with what you're required to do um, and, and the changes. Yeah, absolutely. And keep, um, you know, Keep a finger on the button on your, you know, on your phones and on your computers for the, our social media because we're going to try and do these blasts mm -hmm. as soon as they come out to keep you updated, um, as opposed to just visiting the website all the time to see what's going on. So we'll try and keep you updated um, on those. Uh, more changes to come. I hope this was helpful, Lisa. Thank you as always. It's always, I, I mean, I know we're big nerds about this stuff, but I always have fun doing these presentations with you. Um, so thank you for, for, for doing this um, with me. Thank you everybody for joining us. Thank you for all the questions. Um, reach out to us if you have more questions 
And I think we're ready to sign off. So thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank Thanks, you. Eric. Thank you.